So we're gonna to try to estimate the dielectric constant for helium, which has got roughly twice the ionization potential of pi. We could do it for hydrogen, but uh, you know, hydrogen is always H2, so I think let's just do it for helium because that will exist as a, as a single atom in, in gaseous form, okay? And it, helium and hydrogen are pretty closely related. Turns out the ionization potential for helium, that's the energy that it takes to strip off an electron, is about twice that of hydrogen, okay? So in your homework, previously we had calculated the ionization potential for hydrogen, we got 13.6 electron volts. So if we just double that, we'll get 27.2 electron volts for the ionization potential of uh, helium. So, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss an update. Leave a comment below to help grow the channel, and don't forget to smash the like button. Okay, lecture 105, dipoles and molecular polarizability. Sounds like a mouthful, right? But what are we talking about? Well, for starters, I want to consider dipole So we remember that a dipole, if we take two equal and opposite charges and separate them by a distance d, then that's what we call a dipole, okay? So it's got a positive pole and a negative pole, hence dipole. Um, and let's orient it on an x, y, z, this is a three-dimensional graph, right? And I'm gonna orient the alignment of the two charges on the z axis, okay? Such that it's equidistant from the origin. So this is, like this upper distance would be d over two, and this bottom distance here from the origin to minus q would be minus d over 2, okay? So, we want to write or calculate the, the potential for this. I'll write v of x, y, and z is equal to Coulomb's constant k all times q, yeah, this will be a positive q, and so now I'm going to write r here, but what is r? It's the square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared. But here, right, it's, it's going to be z minus z minus d over 2, right, squared. So we'll put z minus d over 2 squared. And then minus, this is the negative charge, hence the minus sign. Now we're on the bottom charge, right? And the radius in this case is gonna be x squared plus y squared plus z plus d over two quantity squared. And that is the potential for the dipole, okay? It's in three dimensions, so it's got all the ugliness to it that we normally get in three dimensions. Also, it's done in Cartesian coordinates. So we use x, y, and z, okay? So does everyone understand what I've written so far? This is just Q over R, okay? So this is a distance. I would have to pick a point out here somewhere. Should have drawn that first. We'll just call this point P, some point of interest. And so this R vector that you see is the R vector going to this point P, okay? So you have to first compute it with respect to the distance of p to this plus q, which would be this distance here, and then the distance of p to this minus q down here is a different distance, you can see, right? So really what we've got is this distance and this distance, yes? Yeah. yeah I shouldn't have drawn this line here, that's not really what we're doing. There. So here's the first r right here, yes? Yeah. And then this distance here is right here, okay? So clear on what we're doing? Yeah. Well. You can do more with this, however, but we need to make some approximations. So if I, if I pull out this little piece down here, and just take a look at that for a minute, and I think I'll leave this piece for you guys as a homework assignment to do this, okay? But let's look at this quantity, uh, z minus d over 2 squared. If I divide out a z, this then becomes z squared times 1 minus, let me write that a little neater, d over 2z. And you may remember the binomial approximation, right? So if this distance d is small compared to any of the other distances we're talking about here, right? So when we're farther away, this number will be big, this number will be small, 
And so this term, one minus this term will be a small number. We can use the binomial approximation and this will give me z squared times, not two, I'm not taking a derivative, sorry, uh, times one minus two times d over two z, which equals z squared minus, the twos will cancel, and I'll get this. I'm missing a z, ah, oh, I need another z here, times z, sorry. There's only one z in the denominator, so when I multiplied by z squared, only one of those canceled, okay? But notice we also we have a square root down here, right? And we can we can take a we can do a binomial approximation on that as well, okay? So then let's rewrite all the stuff under here. X squared plus y squared plus this term is going to now become z squared minus dz. Remember that this part here is just r. Well, r squared actually, I guess. R squared. So that I can write this as r squared minus dz. And so that 1 over this square root of x squared plus y squared plus z minus d over 2 squared can be written as 1 over the square root of r squared 1 minus z d over r squared. So you see what I did here? I just factored out the r squared. r squared times 1 minus dz over r squared, yeah? So we can rewrite this as 1 over r. Now I'm going to write the square root like this, 1 minus zd over r squared to the minus 1 half, okay? So minus 1 half because it's in the denominator, right? Now here we can use the binomial expansion yet again, right? Because again, we're assuming that r is some large distance compared to d, right? So we'll use it once again, and we get this is approximately, uh, it's going to be 1 over r, 1 plus z d over 2 r squared. So that was just working on this term here, right? We just used the binomial expansion twice. If you don't remember the binomial expansion, I can just write it up here real quick. 1 plus, I don't know, x to the n is approximately equal to 1 plus nx if x is small, less than 1, okay? So if x is less than 1, then you can approximate 1 plus x to the n as 1 plus nx. Let me just erase this here because I want to transcribe this down here. K, and we get q. No, let's do it like this. Let's do Q over R times 1 plus Z D over 2 R squared, like this. And now, this second term here, if we were to do exactly this stuff, and I think I'll have you do that in the homework, then this term here is just going to become Q over R times 1 minus Z D over 2 R squared. Okay, so there's just a sign difference. Got it? Yeah. And so if we actually take the difference of these two, right, what do we get? Well, we get q over r minus q over r, so that's gone, right? Let me write this in parentheses, q over r uh, zd over 2r squared minus minus becomes plus q over r z d over 2 r squared, which is going to give us, um, we got a half and a half makes one, so we'll get q z d over, we got r times r squared over r cubed. And so typically what people do, and this again, this is just your potential as a function of x, y, and z, people will write like this z over r cubed times qd, where qd is what we call the, the dipole moment. Okay, so I'll write p. Um, it is a vector because, no, it's not a vector, sorry, it's just a distance, my bad. Dipole moment, so where this is just equal to the charge times the separation. Okay, 
We've talked about dipole moment before. We did a simple one-dimensional calculation on it and basically derived this, but in a much simpler, more straightforward way. Okay? But I wanted to try to take the... I want you to see the, the way that we treat this in three dimensions because I'm actually going to use it not in the... Well, actually, in the next lecture, I'll use some of the machinery from this. So it's important for us to see it. Um, let me write this over here. So the potential as a function of x, y, and z is equal to k, the dielectric constant, or not, not the dielectric constant, that's the Coulomb constant, sorry, uh, times z over r cubed times the dipole moment. Just a little more that I want to do with it, though. If we think of this as the dipole moment, and this is our point P. Oh, uh, that's a terrible choice. I used P for this. Let me change this to uh, M or something. M. There we go. Got it. So this distance here is Z. This distance here is R. Our dipole is oriented along this direction here. This is the angle theta. The cosine of theta is equal to Z over R. It's the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Yeah? yeah? So that allows me to write the potential as K. I put as P over R squared. And then I put Z over R right here. See, if I recombine that, I'll get R cubed in the denominator, and I'll get ZP in the numerator, right? But Z over R is just the cosine of theta. You see that? So I can replace this term, z over r, with the cosine of theta. So that I can more generally write this as the Coulomb constant times p times the cosine of theta divided by r squared. But p times the cosine of theta, right, is just the definition of, if, if we call this r12 hat, right, it's the direction between the dipole and some point of interest. So I'm just going to call it r hat. That's probably just as good. R hat, right? That's the direct. That's the line connecting the dipole and the field point. All right. So I can write this as p dot r over r squared, magnitude of r squared. But that's a unit vector. I can also make it into a just a regular vector, and so we'll have that p dot r over r squared. There. That's the kind of the final product there. So let me replace this with this term here. It's also equal to k p dot r over r cubed uh, squared. No, cubed. Cubed, yes, because that was a unit vector. Um, what about the electric field, right? Well, as it turns out, we can relate the electric field to the derivative of the potential, right? Where this is that, this is again that three-dimensional derivative, right? But we can do them compo one component at a time, so we don't have to worry too much about that. And I think uh, part of the homework I will give you will involve two of the easier ones, okay? And I'll do the hard one here real quick. Um, if we just look at the x component of this, I just want to look at what is the x component of the electric field, right? That's along this direction, yes? It's going to be the k, now we need the minus sign, k um, times the partial x to, well, actually, I want to do the z component. That would be the harder one. Sorry. e sub z is equal to minus k, partial derivative of z. Remember, that just means that we're going to consider all the other components, x and y, like they were constants, okay? That's what this partial derivative business means. Well, I can pull, give me a second here. Minus k p times the partial derivative of z over r cubed. Not the easiest, but we, we can use the quotient rule on this, right? So, who remembers the, the quotient rule? Ho de high minus high de ho divided by ho ho, right? So, 
Cody high, that's going to be, so what is this derivative? I'm just going to look at the derivative. Uh, let's see, let's write it like this. Minus kp times, we've got the bottom term, that's the hope, and the d high. Well, d over dz of just z is just 1, right? Minus hi d ho, so that's z, times the derivative with respect to z of r, right? So let's write it like this, d over d, uh, d over d, z of r cubed, all divided by r to the sixth, because we square the bottom, right? So now we have to worry about what is this d over dz of r cubed business? Well, let's rewrite the r cubed like this, d over dz of x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the three halves power. So. Now we have to uh, chain rule this. So what do we get? Well, that would be equal to um, three, ha three halves times x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the three halves minus one. What is three halves minus one? That's three halves minus two. That's one half, right? Now times the derivative of the inside part, right? Well, this is zero, this is zero, but this will be two z. So that cancels this two here and we just get a z. So, I'm going to replace the, this part right here with what we got. We'll get 3z squared, because we got another z here, right? And this is just, this is just r, right? It's just r. This is the square root of one, uh, the square root of x squared, y squared, z squared is just, that's just the definition of the magnitude of r, right? So we get an r here, which is then equal to minus k times the polarization and this will become 1 over r cubed minus 3 z squared over r to the fifth. And I think that's right. And so in the homework from a while back, you had done a problem where you calculated this term, right? And that would have been accurate. This term would be correct if you only were, say, somewhere along the z-axis. But now you see as we move at some angle, right, we, we introduce this r to the fifth component, right, this off-axis component. Okay? Right. And in fact, if you go back to the definition of cosine of theta uh, that we had before, you can show that this is equal to this term here. That's the E sub Z component. So you can put in directly the dependence on the angle theta, right? So that's the angle that you're making with respect to the Z axis here. Um, and so I think as a homework assignment, I'll let you work on some more of this uh, because I want to talk next about molecular polarizability. And we're going to approach this in a very simple way. So no three-dimensional derivatives this time, okay? Let's start with a, a really simple model of an atom, okay? So we've got a nucleus, which I'll write, I'll write like this. It's positively charged, so I'll write it like this. And it's connected to some electrons, right? And we're going to approximate this as being connected by a spring, okay? So we've got a clamped nucleus and we've connected the electron to it with a spring. Now, is that realistic? Not particularly, but let's see how good it works. Uh, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to figure out what the dielectric constant is for like hydrogen or helium or something like that, okay? I think probably helium um, because hydrogen is uh, diatomic. So, of course, helium is, is not. Do you understand this model? Yeah? yeah? So what are the forces that we have here, right? Well, we have a spring force. Newton's second law, right, says that the mass times the acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces. Well, what are the forces? I want to apply an electric field, okay? And I want to see what it does to this, okay? So if I apply an electric field, I'm going to have, let's call this charge Q. I'll have Q times the electric field. That's one force, right? Because remember, electric field is just defined as the force divided by, you know, force per unit charge. So if I multi multiply charge times the electric field, 
then I get a force. Now when this happens, of course, this spring is going to stretch out, right? So once I put that field on, my spring is going to stretch out. Uh, I need to specify what the spring constant of this spring is. So the spring constant, unfortunately, k, and we, we're going to, you know, we know k from Coulomb's constant, but it's a different k, right? Spring constant is equal to, um, well, let's write it in terms of its frequency. I wanted to do that anyways. So it's usually k over m is equal to omega naught squared, okay? That's like the, if you have a stiff spring and a loose spring, and you give them a push, they'll vibrate. The stiff spring will have a high natural frequency of oscillation, and the, the loosey spring will have a lower frequency of oscillation, okay? So these are related. So we'll write this as the restoring force is minus omega naught squared times the displacement x. So we need an act, we'll call this the x-axis, okay? And we're really just going to stay in one dimension, so I'm not going to worry about any of the vector quantities, okay? Now, this is a fairly simple equation, right? Except, well, I guess it's not because we've, if we look at it, it's, it's really a second order differential equation. We could write it like m times the acceleration plus, I'm going to just move this over here, omega naught squared x equals this. So this would be a time dependent system, right, which would allow us to, we could be talking about something completely different. We could be talking about how, a simple approximation about how atomic dipoles can radiate and create radiation. But I'm interested in the electrostatics here, so there aren't going to be any acceleration, so this is going to simplify greatly, okay, because I'm going to let the acceleration become zero. No acceleration, just electrostatics. So we apply, you know, a constant electric field, we give it a second for everything to settle down, and we just end up with a stretch spring. And if that's the case, and this is no longer a difficult differential equation, it's not actually a difficult differential equation, it's actually pretty easy, but you guys don't know differential equations for sure, since you're just barely learning calculus now, right? So, um, but now it's, a, it's kind of an easy problem to solve, right? Because we got rid of the, the hard part of it, and we can just solve for x, okay? And if we do, what do we get? We get that solve for x, x is going to be equal to q, times e over m omega naught squared, right? Just divide out the m and the omega naught squared, and there you go, you have x, okay? So there's our solution. Now, we just got done talking about dipoles, right? And we, you remember that the dipole was the charge times some separation, right? Well, here, let's call our separation x. That's what this is, right? It's the distance between these two charges. So that's q squared now, because we already had a q in here, times e over m omega naught squared. So this is like the dipole moment of our very simplistic model of an atom that we've created, right? So people define a term, they call it the polarizability of, a, the, I think, polarizability of an atom, or molecular polarizability, I guess, uh, and it's epsilon naught alpha E. So this term alpha, they call the molecular polarizability, okay? And the dipole moment that you create, or the polarization that you create in, a, in, a, in an atom, right, or in a molecule, is proportional to the field you apply, right? The stronger the field, the more charges get separated, so the stronger the dipole moment but also the molecular polarizability, which is the measure of how easily polarized it is. So in our simple models case, it's really how tight is that spring, right? If it's a loose spring, it's easy to pull, separate the charges, then alpha would be big. Uh, if it's not, then it would be small. So if we compare this uh, with this, right, then we can see that in our simple model, the molecular polarizability uh, is just this term Q squared over m omega squared, uh, well, we need to put the epsilon naught m omega squared in there so that it cancels with this epsilon naught because there's no epsilon naught in here, right? So here is our, for our simple atom or molecule, our molecular polarizability is this. If we're talking about 
more than one of these, now we have to account for how do we deal with them when there are a bunch of them. It's like a gas now, not just a single atom or molecule. That's not so useful to us. We want to try to get a macroscopic picture of it. So if we consider a gas, right, then we'll have a bunch of these gas atoms or molecules floating around, okay, and we'll treat them as a collection, and they'll have a, they'll have a, 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 they'll have a, a number density, right, a certain number of atoms per unit volume, and so we're going to write the macroscopic polarization as being equal to the number density times the kind of atomic polarization, which usually write as a little p. I know it's a horrible distinction, right? Big P, little p, they both look like p's, right? Um, but we can quickly replace that because this is just in epsilon naught alpha e. And you remember from last time that we had this thing, the dielectric constant, right? This is a macroscopic quantity, okay? Dielectric constant, meaning it applies to large collections of atoms and molecules, okay? It's for gases, like air that we're breathing, for solids, like glass and the windows, okay? But we're going to try to relate it to our simple atomic model, okay? We defined the dielectric constant as 1 plus the susceptibility. And so that P equals epsilon naught chi E is going to become epsilon naught kappa minus 1 times E. And so you see that we, if we compare this with what we have up here, right, we can see that alpha is equal to the dielectric constant minus 1. Really, it's n times alpha. The density got to be in there as well. Right, because I'm just comparing this with this, we see that alpha is equal to kappa minus 1, or n times alpha is equal to kappa minus 1, right? So we're relating our molecular polarizability, which is this thing that has to do with our spring, right, to the dielectric constant, which is this, this quantity that you can read about in tables, right? We tabulate this stuff. It's data that we know for different materials, right? So we're trying to predict what is going to be the dielectric constant uh, for, you know, some material, which will up with in just a second. but so, so we can solve for this, right? Solve for kappa, and that's just going to be 1 plus n times alpha. So let's replace n time, let's replace alpha with q squared over epsilon naught mass omega squared, okay? Put this up over here. So the dielectric constant kappa is 1 plus n Q squared over epsilon naught m omega squared. And also I'll just write it alpha is equal to Q squared over epsilon naught m omega squared. That's our molecular polarizability. Okay. So we're going to try to estimate the dielectric constant for helium which has got roughly twice the ionization potential of hydrogen. We could do it for hydrogen, but uh, you know, hydrogen is always H2, so I think let's just do it for helium because that will exist as a, as a single atom in, in gaseous form, okay? And it, helium and hydrogen are pretty closely related. It turns out the ionization potential for helium, that's the energy that it takes to strip off an electron, is about twice that of hydrogen, okay? So in your homework, previously we had calculated the ionization potential for hydrogen. It got 13.6 electron volts. So if we just double that, We'll get 27.2 electron volts for the ionization potential of uh, helium. So helium, um, 27.2 electron volts. Now, we, we do need to draw upon one formula from quantum mechanics because we have to relate this ionization. How do we relate this ionization energy to our molecular polarizability that we came up with? by treating atoms as charges on springs. And we're going to use a formula from quantum mechanics which says that the energy is equal to h bar omega. h bar is a constant. It's called Planck's constant. Okay? And in quantum mechanics, you, you use Planck's constant all the time. Um, it's something from quantum theory. We don't need to worry too much about it right now, but it does allow us, though, to, to relate the frequency of our spring into an energy. So it, it tells me that I can just simply replace my frequency omega with the energy uh, divided by h bar. 
And h bar, by the way, is equal to 1.055 times 10 to the minus 34 meters squared kilograms per second. Yeah, I always think of it as units of action, uh, but that's it's not uh, important at this point. So if we convert this 27.2 electron volts into joules, we're going to get uh, 4.36 times 10 to the minus 18. Minus 18 joules, that's this ionization energy. And then we're going to divide that by Planck's constant, h bar, and that's going to give us 4.13 times 10 to the 16th. And it turns out the units of this are just going to be hertz, okay? So I've just converted this ionization potential, something we observe experimentally, or you can calculate in various circumstances. And I'm going to convert that into SI units, joules, right? Because yeah. there's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 electron volts per joule. Um, and then divide that by h bar using this formula we get from quantum theory, okay? And that's going to give me this number here, 4 times 10 to the 16 hertz. I'll call it KHE for helium. This is the dielectric constant for helium from our calculation and our simple, simple model is going to be 1 plus, let me just write in the, the terms that we'll put in. In, we'll need E squared over epsilon naught. We'll need the mass of the electron and we'll need this frequency here squared. Yeah, so mass of the electron, this frequency which we calculated here, right? So this is going to be our omega. Epsilon naught, known quantity. Uh, the atomic, the, the density of the particles though, that's the one quantity that seems to be missing. And so there's a, at standard temperature and pressure, most gases, right, uh, are going to be at 2.7 times 10 to the 25 per meter cubed, okay? So that's at standard temperature and pressure, that's zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, okay? Um, all, at that point, at that, for gases, they all kind of behave the same, right? Because they're never going to come into contact with each other because they're so far apart. Things are different in liquids, okay? They're going to have variation uh, for different substances in liquids, but for gases, this formula, this number we can use uh, all by itself. If we put all that in and we plug all these numbers in and we calculate this and plug it into our calculator. Um, I'm not going to write it out here, but I'll just show you what we got. We get 1.00005. And the experimental, or actual, right over here, K helium actual is equal to 1.000068. So now I know it's a, like 40% error, 30% error, something like that, but it's not bad, right? For such a crude, simplistic approximation of an atom, okay, for a helium atom as an electron attached to a positively charged nucleus on a spring, okay? All right. Yeah, so that's the dielectric constant. So that would be if you were to put helium gas in between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor, you could figure out how much you're going to increase the charge capacity of that capacitor using this, okay? And so we've related it back to a simple atomic model. Uh, next time, I'll try to put together a lecture that allows us to talk about the microscopic aspect of dielectrics in solid state material, because uh, I'd like to talk about ferroelectrics, because I, I worked with ferroelectrics uh, when I was a grad student, so I thought it'd be fun to put some of that in. But um, that's all I have, though. Okay? Any questions? Okay, that's it.